Good evening, one and all. Welcome to the webinar series of cochlear implants, past, present, and future. I'm Dr. Gangaji Kamath, fellow trainee in uh, Skull Base Surgery under World Skull Base Institute. And I'm privileged to be working under Dr. Sampachan Prasad Rao, who's a consultant at Manipal Hospital and uh, Columbia Asia and Dapolo Spectra Kodmanga. So I would be starting with my topic and you know, let's begin with how the cochlear implant was started. So it was Alessandro Volta who became the first to stimulate the auditory nerve uh, electrically. And Andre and Charles placed a wire directly on the auditory nerve on the patient deafened by temporal bone resection for cholesteatoma. Going forward in 1960, John Doyle and James Doyle, along with Dr. William House, tested the electrical activity of surgically exposed facial nerve via transcanal approach. And in 1961, same patient was reoperated through posterior tympanectomy to replace a single electrode with a four channel probe. And same year, another patient with middle cranial force approach was tried. So we must say that Dr. House was the first one to uh, develop the cochlear implant. And uh, in 1966, Simons and White from Stanford University inserted a six-channel electrode array into the cochlea with more precision. And Dr. House finally inserted the electrode array through scalar tympani driven by implantable receiver stimulator. Dr. House uh, developed the speech processor, uh, which had interface with the House 3M single electrode implant, and in 1973, it was patented and commercially marketed. However, the multi-channel cochlear implant was uh, invented by uh, Clark, and he founded the cochlear company as well. So coming to the present, so there's change in the cochlear implant landscape. So uh, more and more early implantation is uh, advised for better speech and language outcomes and there is more implant success due to bilateral implantation, maternal sensitivity and family environment. So there is increased frequency of uh, cochlear implantation in congenital deaf children, children with inner ear malformations, children with multiple disabilities, postlingually deaf adults with normal cochlear anatomy. So we will be proud to say if this trial uh, is successful and the implants come into market uh, where already four trials have been conducted in GI Jitmar and CMC Vello. And it was envisioned by our own uh, past president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, where the price estimate of this implant is uh, to be about rupees one lakh, which is much, much lesser than the existing price of the implants. So what are the strategies we have to develop? We have to develop a reliable uh, strategy for a reliable device for lifetime and development of electrode arrays which stimulate more than one site in the cochlea, progressive improvements in sound processing strategies and uh, the internal components which are earlier were single electrodes and now we have 22 and 24 electrode multi-channel devices, advantage of tonotopic organization and present pitch information. So there are contemporary arrays which are less traumatic and more focused delivery of electric current, standard arrays which have uh, again for the normal cochlea, compressed arrays which contain same number of electrodes as the standard array used with cochlear anomalies that may prevent complete insertion of a longer standard array. So earlier there were straight flexible electrode arrays, now more advanced technology of pre-coiled electrodes have been developed which has the advantage of being less traumatic. And since it's pre-coiled, the electrodes are more in contact with the modulus. So the more and more spiral ganglions are activated with better success. So it is inserted, as you can see here, with an advance of stillet uh, technique where the electrode and the stillet are inserted both. And then the electrode is uh, ejected of the stillet. So coming to the split arrays, which increase the number of intracochlear electrodes into a totally obliterated cochlea, monopolar and bipolar stimulation and stimulation between both arrays. So the technique here is two cochlear stimulus are made. The first one is anterior to the round window, which stimulates the basal turn where the electrodes are placed into the scalar tympani. And the second cochlear stem is done at the second turn, uh, coral to the cochlear forming process and 2 mm anterior to the oval window and the electrodes are placed in the scalar vestibuli. So you can see the two electrodes with the ground electrode and this is the nucleus double array cochlear implant. 
so there are mri friendly couple uh, uh, electrodes developed by medel concert and high res advance which is again advanced bionics and co uh, cochlea has developed n6 bit counter advanced electrodes so these uh, uh, implants can withstand up to 1.5 tesla mri except for magnet in this artifact that surrounds the internal magnet so the nucleus hybrid device developed by cochlea it provides electroacoustic stimulation for preservation of low frequency hearing in patients in candidates with residual hearing and also it has shortened arrays which helps in deep insertion which is not possible due to anatomical restrictions such as cochlear ossifications or cochlear anomaly so what are the further improvements in speech processing strategies they mimic tonotopic organization, continuous interleaved sampling, filter sound signals into band frequencies. Medal has developed fine structure processing, improved temporal and tonotopic coding of sounds. It improves pitch perception in noise, music appreciation, and sound localization. So advanced bionics has developed virtual channels to increase the number of functional channels beyond the number of physical electrodes. So what is telemetry? Telemetry is for the excitation of the auditory nerve compound action potential monitor. It monitors the proper functioning of the implanted electrodes and electrode contacts to monitor the correct functioning of the external and internal hardware to assess the electrical fields induced in the cochlea and to assess the neural responsiveness, especially when we need to assess intra or cochlear uh, implant uh, success. So coming to the external components, how it's been changed from body-worn speech processors now to your level processors. It is powered by zinc air disposable or rechargeable batteries. And the features here are sub it has separate dials to control on and off sensitivity and volume, different size ear hooks, and it has a various external input ports for FM systems and MP3 players. So the latest single unit speech processors, which is a dev Rondo developed by Medel and Conso developed by Cochlea has two synchronized microphones, which filter out background noise uh, and it filters out transient noise reduction in wind and ambient uh, atmosphere. And also it is compatible with wireless device. So coming to the future, possibilities for the future is to use of autoprotective drugs such as dexamethasone eluting drugs where the oxidative stress or due to traumatic insertion of the electrodes the edema can be reduced and gene therapy use of stem cells to replace the lost sens lost sensory hair cells and neural structures in the cochlea so one more advancement what can be expected is optical optical stimulation of the auditory nerve as you all know, the sound transmission to normal middle ear mechanism is through the external ear, middle ear, and the inner ear. Whereas in, uh, uh, in the uh, cochlear implant through uh, electrical stimulation, it is uh, through the tonotopic organization. Whereas the uh, optical stimulation, here the trials are made with infrared uh, light, and it is found that the light is better confined in space than electrical current. These optical cochlear implants promise to activate the spiral ganglion with higher spatial precision. So coming to the cochlear implantation principles. So what's the principle? So here, when there is hair cell dysfunction, the electrode stimulates spiral ganglion and there is tonotopic organization where the electrode stimulate the modulus near scalar tympani and assigning frequencies to specific electrodes along the length of electrode array, such that stimulation corresponds to highest pitch delivered to basal tone and the lowest to apical. So coming to the components of cochlea, cochlear implants, there are two components, external comp components and internal components. So the external components are the speech processor and the transmitter, which collect, analyze, process, and transmit sound information to the internally implanted device, that's the receiver and the uh, uh, stimulating coil and the electrode array. So uh, the uh, receiving coil, magnet, and internal processors and electrode array are the internal components. So the principle here is transcutaneous transmission and both the internal coil and the uh, uh, transmitter coil are held together with magnets. So coming to the cochlear implant devices, currently there are four leading cochlear companies who uh, provide the implants. One is Advanced Bionics from USA, Cochlear Americas from Australia, Medel Austria, and Oticon Denmark. So what are the changing trends in candidacy? So 
the current trend is we can uh, do cochlear implant even in children less than the age of one year that's from six months of age and then the pre and post linguistic adults and children severe to profound adults and uh, uh, where the hearing aid has not benefited them and the speech deception where there's 50 percent on sentences in quiet in year to be implanted with 60 percent or less in contralateral ear or binaural and in children, pediatric population, there's when there is lack of auditory progress, 30% or less on pediatric word tests. So coming to determining candidacy, as we discussed, so the uh, candidates with severe to profound hear, hearing loss with no benefit from hearing aids are preferred. However, there are absolute contraindications such as complete labyrinthine aplasia, cochlear aplasia, and complete cochlear ossification. So nowadays more and more binaural cochlear implantation increased why because of the ability to recognize speech and noise to localize sound source and it can be single operative setting or in a delayed approach cochlear implantation for unilateral hearing loss increased quality of hearing enhanced speech understanding in noise sound localization and melody recognition so coming to the patient evaluation, patient history, when uh, you have to take in detail about the age of onset, whether it's the, uh, since birth or it's been progressive through childhood and whether it's sudden and uh, uh, whether there's any history of infection such as torch infection, low upguard score, and whether there are any surgeries such as uh, surgeries for chronic otitis media and whether history of meningitis infection leading to labyrinthitis ossifications, are there any family history of hearing loss and then with these genetic causes of hearing loss such as Pendrick syndrome and also we have to die, uh, ask the history in detail about auditory neuropathy where the cochlear hair cells are preserved with absent or abnormal auditory neural response. In this case electrical stimulation with cochlear implants is beneficial. So coming to the adult test battery, we have the Pluton audiometry, speech audiometry, BERA, OAE, nucleocochleography, which is mainly done to uh, see whether the implant will be successful in uh, cochlear aplasia or dysplasia, and in speech evaluation and radiological evaluation. The pediatric protocol is audit auditory brainstem response, auditory steady state response, behavioral observation, genetic testing, and vaccination for meningitis, which mainly includes streptococcal pneumonia and hemophilus influenza, which is given two weeks prior to the surgery, preferably. Imaging forms the most important part of uh, in selecting the candidates. So HRCT and MRI complement each other. However, each has its own benefits. So uh, there's detailed, uh, in HRCT, there's detailed visualization of the bony structures of the middle and inner ear and all relevant anatomical structures such as middle ear, round and oval windows, vestibular aqueduct, segments of the facial nerve and internal auditory canal are visualized. So in MRI, the cochlear vestibular anomalies, visualization of membranous labyrinth, visualization of the eighth nerve in IAC and CPA angle. And uh, when there is a dilemma in cases of history of meningitis, temporal bone fracture or otosclerosis, they, it can lead to cochlear fibrosis and scarring. Sclerosis is detected, picked up by HRCT. However, the early fibrotic changes are picked up by MRI and it can be complemented with contrast enhancement. So coming to the key findings which preclude cochlear implantation, you can see here there's complete co a cochlear aplasia with flattening of the middle ear and here you can see cochlear sclerosis with hypoplastic basal tone and this is the MR, these two are HRCT and these two are MRI uh, images of the internal auditory meters where uh, the uh, uh, facial nerve, cochlear nerve and vestibular nerve are intact and here you can see uh, that the facial nerve is uh, fine and the cochlean, cochlean nerve and vestibular nerve are hypoplastic. So the few key features of HRCT, uh, what we can see here is that there's a large vestibular aqueduct syndrome, uh, a vestibular aqueduct which can lead to intraoperative gushers and you have to see carefully observe for the abnormal position of facial nerve where the labyrinthine segment can be anterior and superiorly displaced, tympanic segment also can be superiorly inferiorly dis displaced or can be at the oval window, master segment can be lateralized or they might be narrow facial recess. In such cases, modified surgical approaches might have to be planned. 
such as retrofacial transatic combined with transkinal or facial dresses combined with the transkinal approach. Selection of ears to receive a cochlear implantation. When the imaging, medical evaluation, and audiology is normal, so you implant the worse ear. When there are abnormalities such as facial nerve deformity, vascular anomaly, or trauma, prior surgery, and uh, you always implant the better ear. Coming to the surgical technique, incisions. Various incisions have been developed over years. So earlier it was a wide post-auricular incision for the, of, uh, to prevent flap necrosis and then there was extended end oral incisions, inverted flap insertions and now there is a, a modified post-auricular incisions which is placed. So uh, skin flaps are developed. Skin flaps developed in the plane of temporal fascia with a thickness of 10 to 12 mm. So the reason for maintaining 10 to 12 mm thickness is beyond the uh, increased thickness leads to failure of magnets to attract each other. So before the incision, marking of template has to be done. A marking should be done using the template, as you can see here. And uh, uh, following the incision and the skin flap elevation, a wide cortical mastoidectomy has to be done, as you can see here. And the facial recess is widely open to see the uh, promontory and the round window. So securing once the uh, facial recess is open, we have to use a, a mark, uh, we have to uh, drill a bony chuff for the receiver stimulator to be uh, uh, seated in the parietal bones. And we come into the uh, cochlear in the electrode insertion. There are two type of insertion. One is through the cochlear stomach and one is through round window insertion. Round window membrane insertion they are, provides the advantage of reduced trauma, prevention of bone dust and blood from entering vestibule and decreased perturbation of perilymph. So round window insertion, uh, straight electrodes are favorable. As you can see here, this is the... Uh, round window where we can, round window niche where we can do the round window insertion. And bony cochlear stomach, this provides the closest approximation to the axis of basal scalar tympani and perimodular electrodes are favorable. So the uh, area of cochlear stomach is anterior inferior to round window. And the uh, uh, size of cochlear stomach should be 1 to 1.4 mm. So coming to the soft surgical techniques, to avoid less trauma to the uh, spiral ganglion, it is differing the cochlear stomach until immediately before electrode insertion, use of large bird to flatten the promontory, preservation of the endosteum of the scalar tympani, smoothing of the bony edges with bursts and dissectors, no suctioning of perilin, gentle electrode insertions, use of a lubricant to facilitate insertion. So once the cochlear stem is performed, we have to fix the receiver stimulator in the bony seat and uh, the electrodes are inserted to Joule's forces and sealing of the cochlear stem is done with temporalis fascia and ground electrodes are placed under the temporalis muscle. So how do we monitor the, uh, how we the cochlear implant success? So there are a few methods what we can do. We can do automatic neural response telemetry testing where the uh, electrodes are tested using uh, compound action potentials. Uh, it's number from one to 22 where the one is uh, uh, for the higher frequency as you go, it's for the lower frequency and interoperative remote automated impedance can be done. So we don't do varia techniques. So it's a different kind of technique through a transcanal approach. It's a non-masterectomy approach where the electrode is threaded by a, a transcanal tunnel and the excess electrode is placed in the supramiatal, uh, 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 supramiatal hollow. And uh, the, uh, through the transcanal tunnel, the electrodes are guided into the cochlear stem site. Majority of various surgeons are inserting the cochlear electrodes via a cochlear stem itself. So the technique here is again tympanometal flap elevation, posterior canal wall tunnel, and then electrode inserts into the cochlea. So what are the advantages? It's uh, a wide visibility and uh, safe inspection of the anatomy, no removal of healthy bone, no change of the anatomy of the mastoid, say, mastoid cavity, no impact on growth in children. However, the pathway for the active electrode has to be additionally created, whereas in mastoidectomy, pathway is already ready. 
So I would like to discuss some interesting case, what we have done. It's a 56 year old female with right ear discharge, right ear pain, hearing loss and facial deviation since one month following alleged history of ear mold insertion into the ear canal. Skull based osteomyelitis was diagnosed and subtotal petrosectomy with blind sac closure was done. Patient had opted for cochlear implantation in lieu of 60 decibel hearing loss. As you can see here, post-surgery, there was grade 4 facial palsy, which has been now uh, improved to grade 2. Grade 3, sorry. So coming to the uh, procedure, the steps, as you can see, granulations, there were multiple granulations all over, which has been cleared. A canal wall down mastoidectomy is performed with the blind sac closure and the white facial nerve decompression is done. Here you can see the vertical segment going up to the uh, geniculate ganglion. And uh, once the facial nerve decompression is done and complete distance clearance was achieved, the electrodes with the receiver stimulator was placed. As you can see here, the station tube is blocked. And this is the petrous part of the uh, petrous uh, carotid uh, region. And you can see here, uh, the, uh, it's, uh, the inser electrode insertions were done through round window insertion. And once the electrodes were inserted, uh, it was packed with temporal fascia and the uh, cavity was uh, sealed, obliterated with the abdominal fat. So this is one of the special consideration which I would like to talk about. So otitis media, uh, patients having CSOM, and uh, if uh, the patient wants the hearing to be preserved, to hear better, then cochlear implantation can be offered if the, if the surgeon is very sure about this is clearance. So it can be done single stage or second stage settings. In our case, uh, we are very sure about the disease clearance and single stage cochlear implantation was done and it was successful. So implantation in children can be done six, as early as six months of age for better development of oral language, speech and hearing. So auditory neuropathy, co cochlear implantation provides a great help in uh, 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 mainly in uh, improving the neural synchrony and to provide better speech perception. So meningitis and ossified cochlea require higher stimulation levels and more adaptive changes in the programming modes. Increased risk of facial stimulation is there. So the method what we can try is insertion into scalar tympani, scalar vestibuli, complete drill out or using split electrodes. So here are a few uh, challenges what we have. So the common cavity malformation, the common cavity malformation in the, is a malformation in which the cochlea and vestibule are represented by a single chamber. As you can see here, it can be exceedingly difficult to place the electrode array close to the neural elements. Modification of the cochlear stem shape and looping of the cochlear implant electrode in the implantable cystic space is recommended. And custom devices are provided by few manufacturers. Cochlear hypoplasia, there are four types of cochlear hypoplasia and due to small size of hypoplastic cochlea, thin and short electrodes are recommended. Coming to cochlear fibrosis, chronic otitis media, temporal bone fractures, meningitis and Kogan syndrome into cochlear fibrosis. Surgical modifications include subtotal petrosectomy, split electrode arrays and inverse approach. So split electrodes here, you can see HRCT, uh, we're showing the split electrodes where the electrodes, these are the basal electrodes and these are apical electrodes. And retrograde electrode, post-meningitic basal and ossification and fibrosis may block unsuccessful anti-grade cochlear implantation. In such cases, retrograde electrode insertion through a cochlear stomy near the apex can be performed as you can see here. So what are the complications? Uh, the complications have reduced considerably where meningitis is less than 0.2% and facial nerve it's less than 0.7%. So the uh, main complications we can expect is this scalp flap problems which can include due to infection, necrosis and because of the thickness. So coming to otitis media, then meningitis which can uh, be prevented with very good IV antibiotics, facial nerve paralysis can be prevented with uh, neuromonitoring, tinnitus, vertigo, which is due to labyrinthitis, electrode migration can happen, which can be prevented by split bridge technique, tight packing around the cochlear stem window or canal wall reconstruction. So device failure can happen uh, due to manufacturing defects or from trauma and 1.5% of implant failure needs to be replaced. 
Facial nerve stimulation can happen when the electrode is conducted through the bone and also stimulates the facial nerve. So what is the post-operative management? Mapping of the speech processor to fit the individual needs of the client using computers and specialized home programming softwares and monitoring performance using speech perception and speech language measures. Continued medical and audiological monitoring and management of the implanted device. So the rehabilitation program should include detection of sound, including localization and spatial test, auditory discrimination, voice quality, speech intelligibility, language comprehension and expression, social skills, lip reading and hearing tactics. So it's a multidisciplinary team what we need to have for success of cochlear implantation. It's the ENT surgeon is involved, an audiologist is involved, speech language therapist is involved, a psychologist and a social worker is involved. So it's a team effort which leads to the success of cochlear implantation. Thank you.